The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. First time visitor. Samuel is a first time visitor. You want to stand up? We have a visitor packet for him. And he's visiting from India. We'll thank him for that. And I just, Jennifer, go ahead. Samuel, I hear the Samuel, I hear the Lord say that. He is going to interrupt some of your plans. The Lord says that he's going to bring you to a place where you can go no further in, in the way that you thought things were going to go, and God is going to set you on a different path. It's almost as though you come to a fork in the road, but you can't see the fork, but the Lord knows it there knows it's there and he's going to direct you another way and the lord says that you're one who's called to intimacy with the lord you're one who's called to the secret things of god and the lord is going to melt your heart and he's going to bring you to that place the things that your heart has longed for the things that the deepest depths of your heart has longed for the lord is going to walk you right into those things and you're going to wonder how did i ever get here and the lord says that's okay i'm just going to take you by the way that I choose, says the Lord. And I'm seeing that there's some things in your life that, that are unsettled. And the Lord says in the process, I'm going to settle those things. I'm going to bring some restitution where some things were stolen from you. And the Lord says there's going to be a recompense, even a financial recompense, that the Lord is going to um, restore that which the enemy has stolen. But not only finances, but I'm seeing in relationships and other areas to your life and the Lord says you don't understand now some of those things but you will understand later and the Lord says he has a plan for every single one of those things that you've been through and I hear the Lord say that he's pleased with your heart and he's been pleased with your responses and he's been pleased with your humility and he's been pleased with your faithfulness so i hear the lord says truly you're one i've called to be a son and the lord says this is going to manifest more and more in the very midst of you says the lord and in the days ahead the lord says you're going to be living an entirely different kind of life because the Lord says you're going to know the deep things of the Spirit, says the Spirit of God. And because of the condition of your heart, I, the Lord, say that when you come to the fork in the road, that you're going to see that one was an agenda, a good intention agenda, but that's going to be laid aside and that he's got a path for you that you didn't plan for your welfare and for your good. So be open and sensitive to the plans and the purposes that you've made and the plans and the purposes that he has for you. Humble yourself, surrender to that, and he, he will shine a light on that path. And it will be unmistakable with multiple confirmations. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Oh, we have a first-time visitor. Oh, and your name is? Terry Lindbergh. Terry. Terry, I hear the Lord say that some of your life has looked like a mess to you. And the Lord says that nothing is going to be wasted, that he has been with you, he's walked you through everything, he's going to walk you through everything that happens in the future. But the Lord says he has a time of healing. He has a time of the balm of Gilead being poured out and touching your heart. The Lord says that he is going to heal the wounded places and he is going to restore the things that the enemy has stolen from you. And the Lord says that your end is far superior than your beginning. And the Lord says, Rest in me, daughter, rest in me, daughter, that the promise to come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, is for you. And the Lord says you're going to know that rest, and you're going to know that peace. And the Lord says it's going to bring delight 
to you. And the Lord says the pain of the past is going to be washed away. And the Lord says you will know the Lord. God is going to make it easy because he's bringing divine appointments into your life that are going to be able to contribute to show you the way of dealing with the internal issues, the pains and the hurts. And it's going to be quick and it's going to be efficient and you're going to find that, that God really did care about all those things and it's not, it's not something to be hidden away and it's not something to be ashamed of and it's not something that's going to stop me from the things that God's got planned for the days ahead. She given a visitor's packet. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I shared with you last week that this would be a week where we're going to test you. All right. And if you cannot handle this test, you need to be in one of our house groups where you can deal with your issues and die to your agendas. All right. One of our deep house groups. We're going to go deep, all right? But this is something that, that I've practiced for as long as I can remember. And it was even at a time when I didn't hear anybody else talking or emphasizing it. And I said, the day is going to come when the word peace, which is all through our Bibles, right? Shalom. All through our Bibles, that word peace, it's on almost every page, and yet very little is understood about it as a supernatural expression. And God basically always used it. I was touchy-feely, uh, basically operated in discerning of spirits, but to discern a spirit you had to be at peace to make a distinction as to what's going on. If you're not at peace, you're clueless. Because some negative emotion, anxiety or whatever, clouds your spiritual perception. and. So I learned the three elements of peace, and it had to do with the Lordship of Jesus. You know, let the peace of God rule. That's Lordship. When He rules, when peace rules, He rules. Now, you may be saved, but like we talked to some people, they live in a constant state of low-grade anxiety. But yet the Scripture says, be anxious for nothing but by prayer. Well, for me, prayer was being with someone. Praying 24-7 is not a complicated fact. It never was for me. But prayer was always an awareness of His presence, even in the hustle and bustle of everyday life. You can pray in the Spirit to yourself. You can, uh, you can just enjoy Him. You know, there's adoration. There's all kinds of prayer. And you can enter in and exchange those all day long. It doesn't have to be effort. And it doesn't enter into works. It enters into awareness, spirit to spirit awareness. And I saw that there's peace with God, right? Everybody's familiar with that. Peace with God, you bo you're born again. You made your peace with God. Matter of fact, you, I saw the three R's and the three P's kind of coincide. There's three P's. Peace with God the peace of God, and the God of peace. Okay? There's also in the three R's that match those three P's, <laughs> is there's reconciliation, peace with God. You reconcile yourself to God. There's the peace of God, which is the peace of God rule. Let the peace of God rule. That's ruling His Lordship. And also the God of peace. When the God of peace, you're reigning as kings and priests. Romans 5.17 in the Amplified says that we were called to reign as kings and priests. So there's reconciliation peace, there's, there's the rule of peace, and there's the reign of peace. Ultimately, I want to encourage people to take the peace challenge. The peace challenge is an indication of where you're at in your Christian walk. Many people pride themselves in their biblical knowledge, but it's, it's really walking the talk, isn't it? And we've taught, even on a simple topic like forgiveness, Roman, I mean, uh, Matthew 18, where it says, unless you forgive from the heart. And yet we built an entire uh, courses throughout the body of Christ that saw that many people do, are sincere, but you're not necessarily forgiving from the heart. And that's very confusing for many people because they're sincere. Well, I'm trying to forgive. It's been a year now. 
I'm trying, then you're, you're actually sincere, but you're doing it wrong. Forgiveness must flow from the heart. And when forgiveness flows from the heart, you reconcile with the differences, and peace is the internal indication that you did it right. A supernatural exchange. You should write that word down. A supernatural transaction, a supernatural exchange, whichever term you use, that's what's supposed to take place with repentance and forgiveness. There needs to be an internal indication that you did it. Right? Not forgive and live with the pain. Or forgiveness is a choice. It starts there, but it's not a choice alone. Okay, this mental ascent is not sufficient. There must be a supernatural exchange. There must be a genuine work of the cross. It must be under the, uh, the grace of God to where all of a sudden He Himself is our peace, is manifested. Is He Himself our peace? Right. Okay, so first of all, I want to start out by those, those three levels of peace, and then I'm going to give you the test that we're going to do for one week. How long did I say? One week. Oh, that's going to be hard. Because then it's not just church on Sunday. That means Monday, Tuesday. You've got to pay attention to the Lord on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You're going to have to walk the talk. With their lips they praise me, but their heart is far from me. You know what that tells me? You can say all the right answers and not be doing it right. Hmm? You have that capacity. Right? With their lips they praise me. That means they're saying all the right stuff. But they're not doing it in the heart. And no matter what the mind thinks, it cannot override what you believe in the heart. What you believe in the heart. As, he, as a man thinketh, not here, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The real you is what's going on in here. Not the, not the hypocrisy or the mask or the, the play acting of Christianity. It's basically what you believe in your heart is the real you. Now, every life, say that's me. Every life, that's, that's me, right, has a mass of opportunities. And here's the two characteristics. This is for note takers, but I want you to, I said we're going to be tested, so you'd be wise to jot down a few things unless you have that impeccable photographic memory and total recall, all right? A, you live by dying. This is just A and B, okay? You live by dying. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we who live are always being delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus might also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life is working in you. If you bring a work of the cross in you, then what you're releasing is anointing to benefit other people. And people need the anointing. They don't need your opinion or your theory. They need the anointing. So you live by dying. And here's the truth when it comes to peace and the supernatural peace of God, here's what will click over. And this is what I want for every believer that's going to mature in the things of God. Life is going to be 10% circumstances, 90% attitude. Peace, when it rules, rules your perception of the world around you. You lose your peace, and whatever takes its place rules your perception of the world around you. That's coming from the heart now. That's being heart ruled. If it's good or bad, whatever's in the heart is what's going to project onto the world around you. And in reality, even in the world, we talked about this uh, a few months ago, even in the world there are people who are resilient, unsaved people who are resilient. And one of the key factors when they study these people, why under such horrible conditions did they, did they amount to something in life? Well, for one thing, they didn't fall prey to being a victim, and everybody's against me, and poor me. Instead, they rose above and maintained an attitude regardless of hardship. Life was 10% circumstances, 90% attitude. Attitude will determine your performance. That's an old John Maxwell teaching. Attitude determines performance from a business point of view. 
J.C. Penney once said that their product, they were working to increase the, 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 the value of their product, but at the same time, their statistics showed them that one bad employee could affect a person never coming back again. One, one bad clerk could affect losing a customer for life. Isn't that interesting? Attitude is powerful, isn't it? So we live by dying. Here's the other point. And this, apart from Derek Prince, when I was a baby Christian, I didn't hear anybody else saying this but me. You fight by yielding. I know you can rebuke and I know you can take authority. I understand all of that if it's from the place of peace. But I'm telling you the real key to an abiding life, to a, to a real John chapter 15 kind of life, abide in me, I'll tell you what, you're going to learn to yield. You're going to use that word surrender and yield and you're not only going to not be afraid of it, you're going to cherish it. So you live by dying. Doesn't that sound, doesn't that sound something you just can't wait to do? You live by dying, and you fight by yielding. When you fight by yielding, I, I, like, I like this, uh, you know, we all know this scripture, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. We know this primarily from King James Version. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. But in our curriculum, we always use the message translation because it gave us little pieces where we could do it gradually. Well, you could do it with that scripture as well. But listen to this in the message. We have these powerful God tools. Don't you love it? We, now see what I like about that, is it's not relying on someone else to do something to me. We have these powerful God tools in us. You have an anointing. It abides in us. All of a sudden now the responsibility for this, this, this life of dealing with issues and agendas is mine. Oh, you mean I can't blame it on the pastor or that other Christian? You mean I can't just run around looking for somebody to give it to me and break it off me? Huh? That can happen, but that's not supposed to be the rule. The rule should be the weapons of our warfare. We have these powerful God tools, and here's what these God tools do. In the message translation, it says, it fits together, and I love it because it covers all three, every loose thought. How many know what a loose thought is? <laughs> well, I'm no good. I can't do nothing. I'm a fit. Yeah, okay. Well, you got to lasso that thing back in, and these God tools, this anointing that abides in you, will take that loose thought and bring it captive. Every loose thought, every loose emotion. You ever have a loose emotion? Ah! You know, any drama queens in here? Drama kings. Uh, okay, that's called a loose emotion. They're like three bad little kids, and all three of them usually are in agreement. When you're in carnality, the mind, the will, and the emotions are all in agreement. They go, yeah, let's, let's go do that. It doesn't matter who started it if the other two contribute, right? But science has, has discovered since the 90s that the culprit of all these things is the emotions. And we didn't learn much about emotions in church. We just learned not to live in emotionalism. And that was about where it ended. And then you had people smiling and bleeding inside because we have to ignore those emotions. I don't talk about them in church. All right? And that's suppressed. And what gets suppressed will be expressed. But this scripture says we have these powerful God tools that basically bring or fit together every loose thought, loose emotion, and loose impulse. What's an impulse? That's a will. You know, you know, did you know that marketers put the high profit items at the checkouts in the stores? That's good marketing for who? Impulsive people. You're sitting there, you weren't intending to buy anything, but you're waiting to check out and all this stuff is right there and that's like that. The highest mark of profitable items are right there for your impulse, your impulse, your impulse. God says, I want to bring those impulses and I want to bring them captive. I want to take those impulsiveness out of you. I want to take those loose runaway emotions. I want to take those loose thoughts that are everywhere all over the map. Anybody ever stay awake at night with loose thoughts? 
Did you ever wake up in the morning and realize how ridiculous the conclusion was? Oh, that daughter of mine, she's just not doing this. My son, he can do, he's going to be doing drugs. And I might get, my daughter might get, by the time you wake up, is I'm going to kill those kids. All right. That's the kind of conclusion you come up with, with runaway thoughts. Do you think they need corralled? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, and the message says, we have these powerful God tools, and their job is to fit every loose thought, every loose emotion, and every impulse into a structure, into a structure of a life that is being shaped by Jesus. Where's Jesus? Point to him real quick. Okay, you're good. I didn't see nobody doing this. Yes, he's there. But it's Jesus in you, the hope of glory, right? All right. Can't trick anybody here. We need more visitors <laughs> who make mistakes. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> so it says, we bring or we fit these loose thoughts, loose emotions, loose impulses into a structure that's being shaped by Je If it's being shaped by Jesus, what's happening to those things? They're not being annihilated. They're being corralled and changed and transformed. You don't quit having a mind. You don't quit having emotions. You don't quit having a will. But now they're, uh, they're being subordinate to a life that's being changed by Jesus in you. And so you still have them, but they're under his authority. They're, they're subordinate. And your mind, will, and emotions are not necessarily bad. They're neutral. And it's basically like a sail on a sailboat. It depends what wind is blowing and affecting them. We want the wind of the Spirit, not the wind of the flesh. Right? We want the wind of the Holy Spirit blowing on that mind, will, and emotion so that there can be an expression of God coming out of us. How do I know if God's ruling? Peace. <laughs> Can't fool you on that one either. All right. So we have these, these God tools. They fit every loose thought, emotion, and impulse into a structure of a life shaped by God. And it says something else. They are, this is very, very important, and the message really emphasizes, they are ready and at hand. So what's that mean? I've been struggling with this for five weeks now. No. The tools were ready and at hand that you can learn to deal with these things in a moment-by-moment -moment relationship. Matter of fact, that's the way I can see if a person's making spiritual progress is how quickly do you deal with something? Remember that time we had that marketing guy? And I said, and we hit on a topic and I went, oh, I need to deal with that. And he says, well, how do you deal with that? And Jennifer says, he just did. That's the way you're supposed to walk in the spirit. You, sur you surrender, you yield, and you deal. And when there's peace, you dealt. And it can be instantaneous, not something you have to rebuke for 30 hours and war against. You know, a lot of spiritual warfare, and spiritual warfare is very real, but I wish we could get to the maturity level to where you uh, discerned the difference between spiritual warfare and your own carnality beating you up. I saw people trying to convince me they're in spiritual warfare all the time, but they've accomplished nothing in the kingdom. That makes me suspect that that's really spiritual warfare. Why does the devil bother with you? you, you you're doing a fine enough job just defeating yourself. <laughs> they don't even need you. Your own carnality is beating you up. That's possible? Is that possible? Sure it is. But is spiritual warfare real? It most certainly is. But you've got to make that distinction so that you're not wasting time giving the devil place or opportunity to further his torment. Because then all he has to do is go, yep, that's right, yep, that's right. And fortify it with a little demonic activity. Yep, yep, yes, you are. <laughs> if you say something that's not scriptural about yourself, yep, yep, you are. Then you got the fortification. 
But in reality, you close that door and he's got no power. He's a legalist. He needs permission. Now, reconcile. Reconcile, rule, and reign lines up with peace with God, the peace of God, and the God of peace. And I looked at it from a maturing point of view, and I say, well, that kind of matches that, that scripture where it says, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of the testimony, and then they loved not their life unto death. That's really total surrender, total abandonment. Totally God living His life through you. Third level Christianity. So I saw peace with God then has to do primarily with reconciling. Pursue peace with all men, without which many of you are not going to see the Lord. And beware lest the bitter root of bitterness spring up into you and it defiles many. It causes you trouble, but it defiles others. You know, if you walk around with barbed wire, you're going to poke people. <laughs> huh? So reconcile is basically Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when you have peace with God, you've reconciled yourself to God. But to me, that's, that's the blood. That's forgiveness. That's the beginning. However, you need to walk in the light as He is in light. You need to walk in that forgiveness so that the blood continually cleanses because it says that we were given the ministry of reconciliation. So, if you're struggling with, I don't know what my ministry is, I don't know. Why don't you just start there? <laughs> start there. Main, maintain that right relationship with God and with one another. I mean, if we saw that as a, as a foundational, you know, um, baseline of Christianity, you would do much better in your specifics. People are trying to live out of the specifics, and the baseline is faulty. You will relate to God the way you relate to people. We're going to be doing a series to, during the summer on relationships, especially with the, the formation of the house groups. I think it's important. But relationship is so important in the kingdom of God. I'm, I mean, I was appalled one time. I had a, I had a leader say uh, that, gee, I sure, wouldn't want, I sure wouldn't want the deeper things of God to interfere with the, my gifting. That's kind of scary. Many said, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? Depart from me, I knew you not. I'd be more concerned about that. All right. So we need both. But we need the maturity and the stability to hold fast to the good things that God has given us. So, again, we live by dying and we fight by yielding. Now, look, uh, while we're on this topic of yielding, I want to say this one thing. I want to get people so proficient in supernatural forgiveness and repentance that when they are tempted, they don't need to forgive because when they're tempted, they yield so quickly. They go, oh. Temptation's not sin, right? Wouldn't it be remarkable to be, to be so sensitive to the Holy Spirit in your day-to-day, moment-by-moment walk that when you're tempted, you go, and I go on there. That quick. That's a walk in the Spirit. And that's the rule of peace. And there's something about when you yield and surrender, the mag draw nigh to God and He will draw near to you, right? You draw nigh to Him. There is a law of central tendency. It's like gravity, but it's spiritual. And He pulls you and He keeps you and He will hold you and you can strengthen it. Over and over by what? Reason of use. So, basically you and the Lord are one spirit together. Temptation is something that's trying to pull you away with the five senses. You feel like being pulled away. We teach this to the kids like this bucket man. All of a sudden my bucket was down here and peaceful, but then the lust started drawing me away. Donuts. Oh, there's donuts. 
and all of a sudden down here, you lose the peace, you get a little anxiety, you start to salivate, uh oh, and you go, no, I yield. You draw nigh to God, He draws nigh to you. Each one gives in to sin when lust pulls them or draws them away. Draws them away from what? All from that relationship with Jesus. So you can be tempted, but you don't have to yield. And then after you get your peace back, then the Holy Spirit of moderation will tell Dennis, you can have one. Huh? Is moderation okay? If you can have one out of peace, that's a whole lot better than having four or five out of lust, isn't it? Huh? Okay. That's your free part. That's... Um, <laughs> I got to tell this part about yielding, though. I told, I told Jennifer, I said, I have to tell on myself in church. If I tell on my sins in church, they will never remember the message, but they will always remember Dennis's shortcomings. <laughs> so I'm going to give you one of these. All right? Because I'm at that, I was at that place recently this week. Years ago, we did traveling ministry, and God always laid it on my heart that I would never promote myself. So it might be okay for someone else to send out advertisements and emails and call pastors for speaking engagements, but I was never allowed to do that. And so uh, we were married, and that's your income when you do traveling ministry. And it was five months without work, so to speak, without a ministry, and I'm not going to promote myself. And Jennifer goes, I'm amazed at how you've maintained peace these five months. You are a really good example. The very next day I had a meltdown. <laughs> right after she complimented me on how well I did for five months. I had a meltdown. My meltdown was I walked around the house talking to myself. Not out loud, but to myself. You are a toad. You, I don't know why I picked that word, but I just said, you are a toad. You, 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 got, you must have missed it somewhere, but I know that I didn't lose my peace, so I couldn't have been doing something sinful wrong, but you, I feel like a toad. And I was getting bummed out after being wonderful for five months, from my wife's point of view. Toad. I get a text message or an email. I think it was a, I think it was a phone call, right, from Molly back there, Pastor Molly, and she says, "I'm getting this word for you. It's just one word over and over and over again. I just have to call. It's Toda. <laughs> How many know what Toda means? That's praise." <laughs> I'm a, I'm a toad. I feel like a toad. Something's wrong. Five months, no work. Toad. Oh, what did I do? Toad. And I got so convicted. I started to praise, and everything broke loose from that point on. So it's really the attitude of your heart will determine performance. And Jennifer shouldn't have complimented me till she should have waited a week <laughs> before she told me how well I'm doing. <laughs> so, I think we're at a place like that now. We've been waiting for, we're on five months on the studio, right? And I'm going, and then I went, oh, I'm not going to be a toad. Uh, 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 uh. And I started praising, so you watch, everything's going to be just fine. But I isn't that funny? Five months again. It was that five month mark. So I go, mm, no toad, toad. Uh, we're gonna praise the Lord and all everything. Attitude. Life is what? Ninety percent attitude, only ten percent circumstances. Now, if you want to make a mountain out of a molehill, you have that capacity. I've seen it. I've done it. Right. But just because you have that capacity doesn't mean you have to use it. All right. So, I saw that God basically has given us this ministry of reconciliation. And this, this is a word that I think is really important for you. Reconcile is peace with God, peace with yourself, peace with other people. You pursue it. Uh, 
God's self and others needs to be just a normative part of your Christian life. But I saw <clears throat> one of the most intriguing things to prevent people from living in condemnation was memorize this little thing, because this will help. This up here has the historical record. The historical record is valuable. This is the heavenly record. So when you're looking for transformation or change, you can't change the historical record. Sometimes that's called regret, which is totally impossible. You can't go do it over. If you forgive or repent of an issue, it should change to peace down here because it does not get, and I hear people say this all the time, even had a, had a person one time say, God says, sin? What sin? That makes God sound like he's having a senior moment or something. No, no. He remembers because it's written in the Word for our reproof and correction. The history is there. It doesn't get erased historically. It gets erased heavenly. It gets blotted out, washed clean, hmm? forgotten Here's the only place it gets forgotten. When you receive forgiveness, a supernatural exchange, a supernatural transaction, it's forgotten here. You know what that means? You can remember it here. Not this forgive and forget doesn't even make sense in, in a carnal way. In a kingdom way, the only place you forget is down here. It's no longer being held against you. David is a man after my own heart who did all my will. Did David do all of the will of God? He made some, he sinned. How about Abraham was a, Abraham make a few goofs of himself? Yeah. But see, when you're cleansed, it's no longer being held against you. It's been erased from the books. It's been erased on the spirit of your heart. So you want forgiveness that changes this. You don't want this, and there's a lot of this out there. Just live with the pain and forgive. Or just forgive mental assent, and when God gets good and ready, He'll take away the pain. You know, like He wants you to stay there. You know, all right? The key is the heavenly record gets cleansed. The historical record is for what purpose? For teaching, for reproof, for correction. So you don't do it again. You don't want to do that. You have a... You have a, a a landmark now, a kind of memorial that you don't want to do that again. And you want to stay in that peace. So that's peace with God. The peace of God, that's the rule of God. And, you know, there's, there's even a negative, uh, two scriptures God gave me as a baby Christian to remind me that there's a negative side of this. And that is Proverbs 25, 28 and Proverbs 16, 32. Proverbs 25 to 28, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. And I love the picture that that, if you have no rule over your spirit, there's no peace protection, which is really the only legitimate wall you should have in your life is peace. Let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind, not putting up walls to people. When we went church to church, we saw almost every Christian, no matter how mature, if they had difficulty relationally with somebody, when they saw them coming, they would go like this. What are they doing? They're protecting their heart from that person. Well, that's self-preservation, that's self-protection. If they say something unkind, it's going to go right through that because you just cut God out of the scenario and you decided to protect yourself rather than let peace guard your heart and your mind. That's going to take some practice, isn't it? Because everywhere we went, from the leaders on down to the congregation, when they were faced with a difficult situation, tightened up in the gut, put up a wall. There's no legitimate wall other than the peace that guards your heart and your mind. And it really will guard your heart and your mind. You just have to try it and relinquish. What do we say? Surrender. You have to surrender to get that peace to guard your heart and your mind. You can't protect yourself. 
no matter how commonplace it is. Whoever has no rule is like a city broken down without walls. What, what, a city without walls was like vulnerable from the enemy. That means you've just, you just got open doors everywhere. He can run roughshod over you with torment. Proverbs 16, 32, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. More powerful than a mover and a shaker is somebody who has rule over their spirit. There's people accomplishing a great deal with energy and willpower. But the real protection comes if you have a rule over your spirit. And when I was a baby Christian, uh, uh, I heard a teacher tell me that they used uh, Mark Antony, the famous general, as an illustration. And they said he was a great general leader, but the lusts of a woman could cause him to be sidetracked easily. He was, in other words, a great general could conquer great, bring forth great accomplishments, and at the same time he was a colossal child. He was an adult adolescent. <laughs> so is that possible? Could you have great giftings and no character? <laughs> he who has no rule. But the challenge for the week ahead is basically the word of your testimony. Now you're all saved by the blood of the Lamb. But this week we're going to overcome by what? The word of our testimony. Uh-oh. And that word of our testimony is basically that we're going to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. What peace? This peace that surpasses all understanding. It's going to guard our heart and our mind in Christ. He Himself is our peace. You need to get to know Him as the God of peace, as a person. Because for me, prayer 24-7 is not talking constantly. It's not praying in the Spirit constantly. It's awareness constantly. When Jennifer and I would travel up to New England, we're sitting in the car. There's times we're not talking, but don't tell me for a minute I'm not aware, spirit to spirit, that we're there. That's the way it needs to be with you and Jesus. That awareness is feasible. But if you can't maintain peace, which is God Himself, if you can't maintain peace, you, you are putting the distance. He didn't go anywhere. He's available. It requires practice by reason of use. Practice makes, you've heard it, practice makes perfect. Practice makes permanent. We want to teach you to abide. And it's by reason of use that practice will make you permanently walking in the presence of God. Now, <clears throat> When God was dealing with me on this about praying 24-7 in the peace and, and as an indicator, He used the scripture, but every, all my friends were word people. And all the study I did in the early days, I did through the uh, same material. And it wasn't anything like what God was teaching me in my prayer time. It was good, but it wasn't like what He was teaching me. And what He was, he was teaching me in my prayer time was, uh, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide asunder soul, spirit, joints, and marrow. Okay? The Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. And God started dealing with me. He says, look at verse 13 because that's what I'm trying to get into you. And it's certainly not anti-Word. But it says that Word, all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him. He wanted me to transition transition to the living Word as a person. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. If you don't make that transition, you can stay pretty religious and knowledgeable. But you could forfeit the intimacy that God had planned for you. So for me, peace was Him. And so practicing His presence was not a complicated concept for me. Praying unceasingly is not a complicated process. But you have to interpret it. If you interpret it that you've got to be praying all the time, you're going to, eventually you get into works doing that. And even to the point of irresponsibility. I have people say they couldn't go to work because they had to pray. 
No, you provide for your family. You go to work. I never had trouble praying at work. And there's all kinds of prayer. But the common one was practicing His presence or an awareness. It's a dual awareness of His nature and my nature fused together. And I'm aware of it now while I'm talking. I can talk on different subjects right now, but it doesn't change awareness. You really can do this. You do not have to compartmentalize. What people do is they have this private time of prayer that's very special. And then they, like, a, like they charge their battery and then go drain the battery all day long. I have no concept of that whatsoever. My concept is special time and all the time. There's no going in and out of prayer because he didn't go anywhere. It's an awareness of presence and that's cultivated. You can be ready for this test. You've got a whole week to do this now. Now, all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him. The God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. The God of peace Himself. Look at Gideon and his army. Do you know how God appeared to Gideon? As Jehovah Shalom. Wait a minute. He's got to go do battle. And yet you appear to Him in a revelation of peace? Or is it the God of peace that will soon crush the enemy beneath your feet? We fail to see the militancy of that peace. And that brings us to the, the, the third element, that not only do you learn how to have him lord or rule and make it the word of your testimony, but ultimately it's what God had planned for us, that we would reign, Romans 5, 17, and the Amplified particular, to reign in life as kings and priests through this man, Christ Jesus. To reign in life. That means here. It means now. Reign in life as kings and priests. But you cannot reign as a king unless you're under the king. This has nothing to do with willpower. This has to do with lordship. This has to do with reigning. And we reign together with him. And quite frankly, I can see three levels of Christianity. I can see the shallow level to where people don't even know how to forgive or don't want to forgive. I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. But I believe that the replaced life is the young man. By the word of their testimony, it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. When that is your legitimate testimony by reason of use. And lastly, that we're seated together with him in heavenly places and reign in this life as kings and priests to where it's, it's so God-oriented that it's others-oriented, but it's others are God, object of love. Fulfilling the intent and purpose of every individual to bring many sons unto glory. Now, to walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of, lust of the flesh. We know that. But in 1 John 4, 17, it says, Love has been perfected among us that we might have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is to us, so are we in this world. As He is to us. As He is to us, so are we. You can't reflect something that you don't have. So as He is to us, at whatever level of that intimate relationship is to us, is what we reflect. And we were called by God right in the beginning of Genesis to reproduce according to kind. What kind are you reproducing? If you're just an accident going somewhere to happen, that's probably what you'll produce. You need to go find other accidents and happen together. That's what people do. Rather than look to where I can excel and move forward in the plans and the purposes of God under the Lordship of Jesus. Okay, you're ready for the test now. All right? One week, you're going to, at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, evaluate the previous day. It's really simple. There's five elements of testing. Are you ready? This is the peace challenge. <clears throat> First of all, make it easy on yourself. <laughs> all circumstances and all people, which is all of life. In other words, yesterday. How much peace did I walk in yesterday? That's simple enough. In, in all, peop all people, all circumstances. 
Life. Life yesterday. How many meltdowns did I have? Did I have any drama, explosions? Any? Okay. Number two. Oh, wait a minute, before we get to number two. In number one, make this distinction in all of life. This is important because we talked about this already. How many things did I deal with as a temptation and didn't give in? If I did give in, did I reconcile with God immediately and ask for forgiveness? There's two parts to that, number one. Temptation, did I deal with temptation successfully? If not, did I forgive? Or I failed? Simple enough? Number two. This is good for your, on your job. In the home with children, in school, it applies to all of life. Did I make every decision from the place of peace? You make business decisions out of anxiety, and I'll promise you it's probably bad. If you made a business decision out of lust, it seemed too good to be true. It just might be too good to be true. Let the peace of God umpire. Let him rule your decision making. See how many decisions that I make yesterday that were preceded from the place of peace. And you make big decisions, little decisions all day long but they should be preceded by peace. Number three. <laughs> On the job in my interpersonal relationships. The third element was, was I influenced by the atmosphere or did I influence the atmosphere? If people were bummed out at work, did I get bummed out? Then you would have to say I was influenced by other people. If you kept your peace, you actually influenced the environment you were in. Being we're videotaped, I can't name names, but we have a particular member of our staff that carries enough peace that when the co-workers are afraid of the boss, they bring him in with them <laughs> because they say he never, gets, he never has a meltdown when you're in the room. He carries the peace into the room. You're to be a envir Holy Ghost environmentalist. You're to create the atmosphere, not succumb to it. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. All right? That's test number three. Test number four. This is for the quiet people who point the finger at the, at the people who talk and say all kinds of stupid stuff. You know, the quiet people say stupid stuff too, but it's in their head. <laughs> all right? Huh? I didn't have any walls with people. That's for the quiet people as well as the talkers. You see, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. This isn't about what other people see. Just because you bit your tongue doesn't make you a saint. You could have bitterness in your heart. You could have walls that go, you're never going to go nowhere near me again. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Right? Right? No walls. No stress. No negative emotions. And I responded rather than reacted. Now that's a lot. How about just say, Respond or react? <laughs> did I respond or did I react? What, what reaction shows you Jesus isn't ruling right now. Responding is surrendering to God and from the place of peace. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. You know, you, that doesn't mean you have to get beat up in the marketplace. You have a right to say yes or no. But anything else is manipulative. So don't fake it with walls in your heart. Are we okay on that one? That's the fourth test. The fifth one is, and I'm going to ask this next week, 
Did you practice? <laughs> Did you actually do this? Because church is notorious for hearing a message, going outside and forgetting it as fast as you got it. This one, you're knowing, oh, there's a way out. Don't come next week. <laughs> but next week, you're going to be held accountable. How, whether or not you apply these five things for one week. Do you think that's too much to ask believers? Mm -mm. Because I see the opposite taking place in church. To gather crowds, we make sure we say everything that's encouraging only. Don't require anything of them. Right? Even the house groups. The only outreach you'll ever need is to reach out and... And we don't want you to open up. We don't need none of that stuff here. I don't want to hear nobody's stuff. Mainly because they don't know what to do with it anyway. We have the tools here. We have the God tools. And we can teach you how to deal with your issues effectively between you and Jesus. And you know, as far as vulnerability, that's what maintained John Wesley's changing England and turning it upside down with hospitals, schools, and orphanages all because of accountability. And really, all I see in our house groups, the only accountability you really need is, to be honest, how, how did you walk your walk this week? How did you do? And here it is, right here, these five questions. That's basically telling you how you and your relationship with God really work, where the rubber meets the road. Not theoretically, because you, you expounded some great theory and you know, by the way, people that expound great theories in a house group usually are hiding from intimacy and intimate relationships, and they want to keep it theoretical by talking Bible. I don't want to talk Bible, I want you to live the Bible. And that's going to require real, genuine relationships. And if you're shy, and you say, I don't know if I can ever open up, you open up at the level that you can. And nobody's going to force you to open up more than you feel led to. That's wrong, too. But you know what? There's times when all of a sudden you realize that you cultivate trust in a relationship and you begin to open up. It's for your own health and safety. It's not for control. It's for safety and for your well-being. So, Father, we just praise you and thank you that in the days ahead, we're going to take this peace challenge. Now, in times past, we didn't give the peace challenge because we had too many people. It would be too intimidating. This peace challenge would be extremely intimidating to the average church person around the world. First, teach them how to properly deal with their issues so they don't feel like a total failure. Do you realize if you don't know how to forgive and repentance and forgiveness does not flow out of you naturally without condemnation? If you don't know how to enjoy the journey of an internal work and intimacy with God, if it just sounds like navel staring and beating myself up and finding garbage I don't want to deal. All right, you, don't take the peace challenge because you don't have any. <laughs> and you, you, you just get discouraged because you've got to learn how to get peace before you can maintain peace. So you have to learn how to this is what our house groups are going to do. Teach you how to deal with your issues and die to idolatry or agendas. An agenda is something that can look really good, but God's not in it. You're, you're in it to promote yourself. A true vision from God now is He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. If the true vision from God, if your dream, you don't see Jesus at the end of it, there's something wrong with your dream. It's, then it's still too much you. Right? He's in the beginning, he's in the end of it. He's the initiator, he's the author, and the initiator, and he's the finisher. Many of you people have dreams that were made by you, not by God. It's your wants and your desires. Do you see God in the end of your dream? If you don't, there's still too much you in it. And you may have to have a funeral for that dream. And then dream again and say, I want to dream what God wants me to dream. And the funny thing is, your gifts and your talents will automatically fit into that dream without you trying. So, Father, we seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Challenge these people. Challenge, 
people watching my Ustream, you need challenge because you've been, you've been soft peddled a low gospel for many years in many cases. You've not been asked or required of you to do anything. I'm challenging you. Go ahead, you, see, you who see yourself mature. Particularly those who see themselves mature but don't go to church no more. It's just them and God. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Do you know the early church, you know why that was in there, Hebrews 10, 24, 25? You know why assembly was so important? Because they would go back to a Judea, Judaistic ritual. To leave the fellowship of the church, you would go backwards. It wasn't just have some time off. No, you would go backwards. There was no place to go to except backwards. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as some do. They did it in the beginning, didn't they? They found it easier to compromise and water it down. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, you come together to spur one another toward love and good deeds. I was a baby Christian, and I started a ministry called CCF, Christian Couples Fellowship. And I saw with 100 couples, 200 people went back to church. The vast majority went back to church, but it was a parachurch ministry that was larger than some churches of people who were wounded in the church and didn't want to go back. And to my remembrance, almost all of them went back to church. But first they had to reconcile their woundings. So you got wounded in church. Big deal. Big deal. It's the wool of sheep that can heal even a shepherd. Your door of trouble needs to be your door of hope. Don't look for a plan B. There's no plan B. God's only got one plan, and that's His church. He don't have a plan B. You might have a plan B, but He doesn't have a plan B. So, Father, seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Challenge people that have never been challenged before in church. People that are watching by Ustream, and I, we have a lot of people watch by Ustream that are really connected with us. But there's people who watch by Ustream by a happen chance, coincidence, YouTube, Ustream. And I'm telling you, I'm challenging you. If you really say that you love God with all your heart, then you find, you, you take this peace challenge. And this peace includes reconciliation and reconciliation is not just you and God it's you God and the people of God you can't say you love God and hate these people deal with your hurt deal with your issues and get back into fellowship one way or another in Jesus name we pray amen the test will be next week be here promptly <laughs> amen you've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. 
be transformed, become all God created you to be, you will never be the same.